Well, in life, there are certain simple choices that have profound consequences on us. I'm talking here about the kind of decisions that determine our direction in life. And if we get this one thing right, well, so many other things will go right as a result and fall into place. But if we get this one thing wrong, nothing else will really go right, no matter how hard we try, it seems. And tonight's chapter is all about one of those simple, profound choices, maybe the most simple and profound choice anyone can make because it'll make or break our lives. And the crucial question is this, whose yoke is on you? And your yoke tonight is no joke. You need to know that. Your yoke will make or break you. A, a simple rhyme I hope you'll remember after tonight, which is that your yoke is no joke. Now, some of you are already wondering, is this a Bible study or a cooking class? Why is Scott so excited about egg yolks? You know, folks, I'm not talking about those kind of yolks. And these are the jokes. These are as good as they'll get. But you see that they're the kind, and not that are used in omelets. And, and though I do check, check those very carefully, I don't know. If you ever see me at Publix over in the egg section, you'll see me turning each one over. And if you wonder why I'm doing that, I hate getting them home and finding out one of them was broken, you know, and that I didn't get all 12. So uh, when I say your yoke is no joke, I'm really talking about the kind of yoke that you use for oxen. If you know the definition of that in the dictionary, it's that a yoke is a piece of wood or leather or some other item designed to hitch two animals together that they might pull in the same direction and share the load. And Jesus used this analogy of a yoke in one of his most memorable invitations to us. It's Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, you probably noticed the word yoke because I already kind of emphasized that. Twice in the verse there that we read in Matthew, it said, my yoke, my yoke. Jesus is talking about that, taking it upon us. But you might not have noticed another repeated word in there, which is also very important, and I want to associate these forever in your mind, which is yoke and rest. Rest, R-E-S-T. Jesus said, if you take my yoke upon me, you will have rest. You'll find rest specifically, he says, for your soul. Now, if you think about rest for your soul, I mean, some of us could just use some rest overall, and, and you think, well, that sounds nice. You know, what does that mean? Does it mean my feet up on the couch there, a nice tea in my hand, a remote in the other hand, or something like that? No. You'll see in this chapter here that we study tonight that it paints a very different picture in the life of Paul. He had emotional and physical and spiritual difficulties that went far beyond what most people will ever experience. But Paul had the right yoke, and because of that, he had a light burden. Because of that, he was able to say, you know what, I am a person at peace. And so he was at rest, a man with rest, in spite of all of the rest of the things that went on in his life. And so if you think about rest for your soul, it's not necessarily synonymous with rest on the soles of your feet. It's talking about something a little more profound than that, something a little more simple than that. The rest Jesus promised is for that sense of peace and calm and confidence, even when there are turbulent times. And the kind of rest that he was talking about there is really found in only one place, which is getting the right yoke. And so that's why I say this is such an incredibly important thing for each one of our lives. And so when Jesus used the word yoke, right away it should signal something to us in Matthew 11, which is he's implying that every life is going to have its hardships. Okay, because a yoke was a thing that was used for hard labor. It was something that was used when there was work to be done, when there were loads to be lifted, when there were burdens to be borne, when there were going to be some blood, sweat, and tears along the tracks. And so Jesus here was saying, you know what? I'm not saying that you're never going to have some hard times. What I am saying is that if you hook up with me, you will find every load to be lighter, you will find every burden to be bearable, and you will find that any work will be worth it. And so everyone has a yoke in life, whether you know it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you say, well, Jesus is the yoke that I'm looking at or some other yoke. Well, everybody has one. We don't have a choice not to have some difficulties and hardships. But if you're yoked together with Jesus here tonight, there is something that you can know. That the yoke that's on you, well, the joke will never be on you because you'll be able to say, hey, you know what? I made the right choice in life. I made the right choices in life. And this is a question to very carefully consider whose yoke is on you tonight. Because with God's yoke, we will always have rest. 
And without God's yoke, we will always be restless, no matter what else happens in our life, no matter what else we have or don't have in our life. And so your yoke, again, no joke, no light or laughing matter for you to decide. And so it will set the very direction of your life. Your yoke will determine whether or not you find life to be relatively easy or whether you find your burdens more than you could possibly bear. And so what it means to us practically, well, let's take a look at what this yoke of Jesus means in our life here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what it says. Paul says, we then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I heard you, in the day of salvation I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And Paul says, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Now, stopping right there, you'll see in the first three verses of this chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to consider this question again, whose yoke is on you? And the first thing that I want to think with on you is that if you have God's yoke in your life, if that's what's hooked up in your life, you're going to be living by God's grace. And that may seem simple at first, but I want you to think about what this means to really not just be saved by grace, but growing by grace, actually going forward always by the power of God's grace in your life. Now, verse 1 talks about being a worker together with him. Who's it talking about? Well, the him is Jesus. And so we will be living like Jesus, giving the message that Jesus had, which was a life of grace. And you can kind of picture Paul, if you will, in a wooden harness there around his neck. That's what a yoke was. On the other spot in that yoke, there was another opening there. And in that opening, Jesus there. Both of them plowing the fields of grace together. And the great thing is you can put yourself into that picture too. Not just Paul there, but you could say, you know what? God has a spot for me in that yoke as well. Now, how did it happen in Paul's life? Well, Paul had taken Jesus up on that offer. Jesus said, hey, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me and I am going to give you rest for your soul. And Paul said, hey, that sounds like the best offer I've ever heard. I'll take it. And so he did do that. He teamed up with Jesus. He learned of Jesus. He lived his life in close connection with Jesus. And Paul says something really huge here about God's grace with one word in verse 1. Sometimes it's the little things in God's word that will really jump out to you and mean something to you. And I hope this is one of them tonight, which is the word with. It says workers with him. What this means, and this may be a breakthrough for some, is that the Christian life is not doing things for God. It's doing things with God. Now, what's the difference for that? Well, many people think they're kind of going to do great things for God. They're really thinking that God got a great deal when he uh, came to them and called them and all that. And they kind of have, the, have the mighty mouse mentality. What's that? Here I come to save the day. Do you remember that one? Well, that's how many people think it is with Christ. You know, that he got them and now I'm going to come and fix everything that hasn't been fixed yet. And you know what happens? There's a great burnout in a person like that. There's so often frustration and restlessness even after they come to Christ. Why? Because they think it all depends on them. And so God very clearly throughout the scripture says, look, I don't want you to do something for me. I want you to do something with me. See, that's what grace is all about, doing something with God, not for him. And you know what it's like to work with God? Well, it's very restful. See, it, it says there that, even in the midst of a tough task, which Paul did have a very tough one, he was able to work with God and say, you know what, it's really God doing it. Now, I think of this illustration. When I wash the car, which doesn't happen too often these days, but every once in a while it does, I think we're under water restrictions, so please nobody uh, you know, call the cops on me. But uh, if I wash the car, when I wash the car, the, the kids will inevitably say, especially when they were younger, they're getting a little bit out of the habit now, but when they were younger, they'd say, I'll help. I'll help. Now, that's the kind of thing that a parent instantly kind of cringes when they hear that. They're like, oh, no. See, I know what that means. It means that it's going to take a lot longer. It's going to waste a lot more water. I'm definitely going to get wet. There's no doubt about that. And the end result will be that the car doesn't look as good. I mean, that's what's going to happen. But I don't say, look, I don't want you to do anything with me. No, in fact, I want to do it with them because I care more about the kids than I care about the car. And so here's the end of the story is that, you know, they'll work with me and we all have a lot of laughs. And the real issue is 
The re relationship is what means something to me, not the result. And so they get to learn a little along the way, and so do I. And one of the things that you see in that is, you know, when I come to God and I say, God, I'm going to help, you know what, I can kind of picture him cringe just a little. Because mm, he knows what that's going to mean. It's going to mean, well, let's see, this is going to take a lot longer, and the end result won't be as good. But the great thing about God, again, is he's not just into results. He's into relationship. That's what the whole scripture says. And so that's when you can find rest for your soul, when you realize, hey, I'm just working with God, and that's not because he needs my help. It's because he loves my help. And he loves the fact that he knows I am the one who really needs more help than anyone else. And a lot gets done in that. That's one of the great things about it. But that's when I come back to the question, whose yoke is on you? Because if it's the easy yoke of relationship, well, that's a great thing. But if it's that hard yoke, of religion. Well, Galatians 5.1 put it this way. Paul was talking about this, and he knew it from first-hand experience. This wasn't theoretical theology for him. He had tried to do things for God his whole life, and he finally learned what it was to do things with God. But he said this to the Galatians. It's a yoke of bondage. He said, don't go back to a yoke of bondage. Don't go back to religion when you could have relationship with God. Don't back, go back to legalism when you could have that loving thing with God. And trying to do things for God and to earn his acceptance and all that, that'll keep a person very, very restless. That's a heavy burden to bear, a heavy yoke. It's like being yoked to a dead ox and saying, not only am I going to try and do things, I'm not going to get any help from the Lord. And so you contrast that with the yoke of Jesus based on God's grace. What is that all about? Well, Jesus said it was light. No matter what, no matter how heavy things get, no matter how difficult things are, if you're doing things with God, well, you'll find that he's the one doing the heavy lifting. There's going to be two pulling together, and guess who's going to be doing most of the pulling? See, and if you come into close contact with Christ, that's what you're going to get. A lot done through your life, but you're going to look at it and say, did we do that? <laughs> well, uh, he, he did that. Yeah, but you got to go along for the ride. And one of the greatest things in life is to cooperate with Jesus so he doesn't have to drag us along. See, I've found over the years that a lot of Christians find Christianity to be very restrictive, kind of like a choker chain, you know, like a dog, one of those choker chains, and they say, yeah, God's yoking me. He's actually choking me. You know, Ugh. Now, we have in our neighborhood one of these little dogs, you know, and it has a, a choker chain there. And, and sometimes I'll see the person walking that dog, and, and that dog is just, you know, up on the back feet on the chain, just, <laughs> you know, and that sort of thing. And just, just hacking, and I mean, <coughs> and I always think, man, the dog is going to die, you know, and just hyperventilating. And I think, well, you know, it's supposed to be a nice walk out with the dog and all this thing. And, and that's how so many people's Christians li and Christian lives look. You know, God's yoke, it just feels like a choker chain around them. And, and the reason? They want to go the other way. They just want to walk a different way than the master wants them to walk. Now, here's the thing. I always feel sorry for the dog, but I especially feel sorry for the owner. Why? Because it's my wife. That's why I feel so <laughs> bad about that it's our dog out there doing this. You know, there's other dogs that do it too. But I, I feel so bad when I see that, you know. But his, his yoke won't choke you if you're willing to go his way. That's one of the things that you'll see, and, and you'll find rest for your soul. So if your life kind of feels like that sometimes, like, ah, Lord, you're choking me. He says, no, I'm just trying to yoke you so that you would go my way. You'll find it to me a much better way. And so again, whose yoke is on you? Well, God, by his grace, has offered to direct our lives, to walk with us through our lives. And he says, hey, I, I already know the right way to go. You want to go my way or you want to go the other way? Well, he will pull, he'll pull the weight. He will bear the burdens if we're yoked with him and if we're willing to go his way. But you know what? So often we aren't willing to let him. That's one of the things. Like that dog, yoked to Jesus, but feeling choked by it, but it's because we want to walk our own way. And so I always think, you know, what Paul has said here in verse 3, let me not be like that dog. That's what he's saying in verse 3. Let me not be like that dog. We give no offense in anything, he says, that our ministry would not be blamed. You see what he's saying there? 
What ministry is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the ministry of getting people yoked up with Jesus. I mean, that was Paul's whole purpose for life. Once he was yoked to Jesus and he said, this is the answer. This is light. This is great. This is wonderful. This is the way to live. Well, he wanted to share that with others. And so he would give the call out to others in that. And Paul knew that a person's yoke is no joke. He knew that it made such a difference in a person's life, a matter literally of life and death, not only enjoying life more here, of course, but the eternal life that God promises to those who follow him. And so Paul was saying, look, I don't want to do anything stupid to mess up the message. I don't want to be like that dog who's choking against the chain and making my life look so hard and difficult as I try to follow the master, that, that people would look and say, well, if that's what it is to follow Christ, to be yoked to him, I don't want that. And so Paul's saying, look, if God would be willing to be yoked with me, well, at least let me be willing to walk with him so that people would be looking at my life and saying, yeah, you know, that does look like the way to do it. And see, the tr and truth is most people do not examine the life of Christ, though his life will hold up to great examination. They examine the life of Christians. That's just the way it is. They look, if they want to know what Christ is about, they're not likely necessarily to crack open a Bible, but they certainly will look at a Christian's life and say, well, that must be what it's all about. And I remember a quote I heard that had a great impact on my life. I'm hoping it'll have the same impact on some lives in here uh, because it was just such a freeing thing for me, uh, though it was a very challenging statement. It was at the beginning of a, a Christian CD that I heard it, but it said the greatest hindrance to the spread of Christianity is Christians who profess Jesus with their lips but then deny him with their life. That is what the unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, Paul is basically saying, look, God, by your grace, don't let that be the case with me. Don't let my life look like that. Don't let me mess up the message of your grace. And if you're a believer here today, I hope we'll all say the same thing, which is, man, I want to stay so close to Christ that I would be taking his yoke upon me willingly, that I would be learning of him, and that I would be finding rest for my soul. And not only being able to do that, but being able to offer the rest to the souls of others. See, he's talking there about a yoke, and a yoke isn't even a leash. It's not even a long-distance thing. It's right there together. And one of the great blessings, of course, that comes with being close to Christ is that yoke, is that Eternal life is that promise that he gives us, but one of the things that comes with that is a responsibility to take it seriously because people are going to associate the two of us together because we're together in that yoke. And so his yoke is light, but it's certainly not to be taken lightly in our lives. And so Paul says here in verse 4, but in all things we, command our, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, that meant whippings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, and in fastings. Now, verse 1, or the first parts there, I talked about God's yoke, meaning that you live by God's grace. And some of you right away would say, well, that doesn't look like God's grace to me, you know. But that brings us to the second point, which is that God's yoke means living at God's pace. At God's pace. See, when you yoke together with Jesus, one of the things that happen is that you will be headed to heaven. That's a great thing. But that doesn't mean you're not going to go through some difficulties here on earth. You have to remember this. Jesus went to the crown by way of the cross. And at times the road to glory can be quite a rocky, difficult path. And the narrow way, as Jesus called it, will be that sometimes, very constricted. But there'll always be room for at least two which is Jesus and you. There's always going to be room at least for that to pass through on that path. And so first on the list of many things that Paul talked about, I just want to focus in on this one word that we could talk about all of them. Tonight, we just want to look at this one. Verse 4, it says, in much patience. Why? Because this one kind of encapsulates all the rest of the things that are going on there. See, that word and the others that follow, he says there, Paul learned to take life at God's pace, not his own pace. How do I find that in there? Well, Remember this, Paul wasn't just out in front of God or he wasn't lagging behind God. He learned to live whatever, whenever, however God was calling him to live. And sometimes Paul probably was saying, man, I wish this would slow down a little. And other times Paul was probably saying, man, I wish this would speed up a little. I mean, he spent a lot of time in prison. And then when he wasn't in prison, he was running away from people trying to stay out of prison. So, you know, his life was like a mixture of many hours of crazy 
things and then a lot of time of stillness and all that. And maybe you can relate to some of that. See, with, with Paul yoked together with Jesus, what it meant is Paul was never, no longer really in charge of the things that went on in his life. He was now living at God's pace and not his own. And so Paul wasn't naturally patient. I don't think anyone is. Nobody's really born patient. But Jesus is very patient. I don't know if you found that about him. Sometimes it's a little bit annoying in some ways. Why? Because he says, take my yoke upon you, and now you get to go wherever I want you to go, whenever I want you to go. And sometimes I say, wait. Sometimes I say, no. Sometimes I say, let's go this way instead. And so in the process of being yoked together with Jesus, Paul learned patience. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is I think it's very stressful to drive, but one of the things I love to do is be a passenger. Why? It's not very stressful. I just kind of hang out in the passenger seat and we get wherever we're going. Now, Paul spent some time in prison. He spent time with people problems, as you see. He underwent incredible tribulation, and all those things produced in him patience and learning to go at God's pace. Now, we often want things at our pace, right? We say, hey, okay, God, I'm interested in patience. Go ahead and give it to me and make it quick. <laughs> but see, here's the thing. When we yoke together with Jesus, we do live life at his pace. But this is the thing. We can begin to experience his peace at any pace. You know, I think about this. A man came to a pastor and he said, Pastor, please pray for me to have patience. And the pastor said, very good, we'll do so. So they closed their eyes, he put his hand on the man, and he said, Lord, please bring this man all kinds of trials and difficulties that are far beyond his ability to handle them. And the guy said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? He said, I'm just doing what you asked me to do. That's how patience comes, right? And so to the people who want to be yoked together with Jesus, well, we'll find that it means you go through life at the same pace he does. Can't go running on ahead. No, you need that patience. Can't go lagging behind because there's going to be perseverance. And sometimes God's going to sit you down and say, hey, this is a green pasture time in your life. It's time to sit down right now. And sometimes God's going to call you to kind of pick up the pace a little and say, you know, this is going to be a time in your life where we're going to do a little bit of running and some, uh, you know, things that are going to be some sprints for you. But Jesus certainly didn't live a lazy life. That's what you see. He had opportunities in opposition that were in abundance. And so in the center section of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, for some it would not be a recruiting poster for Christianity. I mean, he's kind of making a case for why to come to Christ and to give your life to him. And you'd say, Paul, you're not much of a salesman. You know, beatings, oh, missed meals, tumults, that doesn't sound too nice. But Paul was kind of just setting it straight there and saying, you know what, your yoke in life is going to be no joke no matter what. And I don't think any of us could certainly swap stories with Paul. You know, he might come to us and say, well, what did you, uh, you know, experience for Christ in suffering? I w you know, Paul could say, I was shipwrecked twice and beaten many times, lost count. You know, what did you go through, Scott? Well, um, well, I had to sit in an air-conditioned uh, office today and, and work on this teaching, and it was a little stressful getting it ready in time. You know, Paul would say, well, uh, all right, okay. But you see, ministry, well, it's not meant to be misery. It doesn't have to be. That's not what he's talking about. But for all time, Paul wants to give us a little example here to say, you know what, your yoke will be no joke in life. You are going to have to go through some things, but would you rather go through those things alone? Or with God. Those are really the choices that we have. And he says they're workers together with us. And when we are workers together with God, yeah, we're going to lose some sleep sometimes. We're going to feel some fatigue sometimes. We might miss a few meals here and there or have some worse things happen. But the thing to remember is that we, will, we have a God who will never leave us or forsake us through any of those things. And I, again, would say I would rather go through anything in life with Christ than the best of lives without him. And so you see, after a while, Paul was able to say that too. Look, the pace was a little challenging in his life sometimes, and the yoke of, Je of Jesus was not for the lazy. But the truth is that God being with us is the most important thing. And the truth is, yeah, in serving Christ, you'll get tired. You'll get tired sometimes in the work. It can take quite a uh, beating on your nerves if you go and, and serve some of the uh, three-year-olds down the, the, the hall here. You know, right now, there are people in this uh, building being persecuted right now for Christ <laughs> in the children's ministry, you know. 
And some of us, you know, we share our faith and, and it does, it grieves your heart if there's somebody that you love and you care about and you're trying to get them to see it and they don't see it and that sort of thing and you say, man, if you just see the difference that Jesus makes in a life. But sometimes it can be very hard and I've had people say, you know, doesn't the Bible say his yoke would be easy and his burden light? Why doesn't that fit my experience? Why isn't that what I'm seeing? Well, I think it's important to see what the Bible is saying specifically. The word, word easy there in Matthew 11, when we read it, you know what it means literally? It means well-fitted. That's what it means. When he says my yoke is easy, what it mean, means is different yokes for different folks. It means everybody's yoke is going to fit them perfectly. And what might be an impossible burden for one person is exactly what God is able to do through another person. And so when I look on sometimes at people's lives, I'll say, I don't know how they could possibly go through what they're going through. But you realize, again, that God says, hey, you know what? I well fit a yoke for them. And believe me, they're not going through it alone. And so it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. And don't start looking at someone else's life and goes, their life's so light and easy and their burden and all the rest of that. Well, you know what? Different yokes for different folks. And we'll all go through a lot in life. And so God has a specific pace for every person. That's what I see. Just enough to bend your knee, but not enough to break your back. God is interested in bending our knee. He is interested in making sure that we continue to work with him, not for him. Why? Because he knows that's the place of grace. And anything else is a place of incredible burden. Yoke together with God. Well, God will never call you to do anything alone. And so this is the strength that Paul had, and this is where he found it. You see it in verse 6 down through verse 10. I love it. He says, by purity, we're just going to read through it, but think of all these things. By purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers, yet we are true. He says, as unknown, yet well known. As dying, and behold, hey, we're still around. We still live. As chastened, but not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. Now, I find this to be the great paradox that is so present in the Christian life, and it's full of them. God has the scriptures full of these things where he says, my yoke is easy. Again, a yoke is a thing of burden. It was the thing that animals would put on to work hard. And he says, but it's going to be light. It's going to give you rest. How can a yoke bring you rest? How can all of these things be so paradoxical? Well, again, when you yoke together with the Lord, you'll, your life will become a great adventure. It gets really exciting. You'll find yourself abounding in both sorrows and joys. You'll find yourself with all kinds of opportunities that you never had before and all kinds of opposition you never had before. See, when people talk about the abundant life, make sure you understand that it has an abundance of both. That's what Paul was talking about. He said, you know, you think of Jesus, it says he was a man overflowing with joy. The people were drawn to his joy, but it also says he was a man familiar with sorrows. See, and I've never really met people who have abounding joy in Jesus who don't always have a sense of sorrow that also goes with that when you look at the lost of the world. There's so much of both. And in the last 15 years of being yoked together with Jesus, I can say this, I have never been bored. That's for sure. Scared? Yes. Tired? Yes. Blessed? Yes. Stretched? Yes. Bored? No. Never ever have I said, man, uh, this, was a, uh, this was a really bad decision. It's just so boring being going through life together with Jesus. You know? And that's why, you see, the last thing that I want to share with you tonight, the third item, which is God's yoke. How can you know that you're really having it in your life? How can you know that you're really growing in it and seeing it in your life? Well, you're not only going to have your life lived by God's grace. That's an important one. You're going to see yourself living at God's pace, which sometimes will seem very slow and sometimes will seem excruciatingly fast but you're going to see that you're going to be living in God's place. Now, what do you mean by that, Scott? Well, simply this, living in God's place. God's place, yeah, a lot of people would maybe think of that as heaven. Isn't that God's place? Well, think about this. With a yoke, 
it ties two lives together. What does that mean? It means that where one goes, the other goes too. To be in God's yoke, it means to always be in God's place. To be where he is, what he's doing, feeling what he's feeling, seeing what he's seeing, that's God's place. And look what that meant to Paul. This is what it meant to him. Verse 11, O Corinthians. See, the O there is supposed to you know, convey emotion to us. Wow, you know, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open, Paul says. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. In other words, he's saying the yoke that you have chosen in your life is what is causing you so much pain and so much sorrow. He says, now, in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Now, to think about this set of statements right here, remember, Paul was the person who started the church there in Corinth. Of course, it was God who started it through Paul, but Paul had planted that church, and the Corinthian church was very worldly still to this point. And so folks were under all kinds of different yokes. You know, I said different yokes for different folks, but God doesn't want anyone to be under these. This was the yoke of sin. The Bible talks about that, the yoke of sin, the bondage that comes with having a life that's apart from Christ. And also a yoke of legalism. That's one that maybe somebody has a type of spirituality, but really not resting on God's grace. And that was all very prevalent there, either open wickedness or just this religious trip that people were on and and some of the people there in Corinth even treated Paul like his life was just one big joke you know they wrote him off and said this guy we don't want even want to listen to him and Paul is here appealing like a parent you see him calling them even hey I'm speaking to you guys like kids he says he's pleading with them and if you've been a parent if you've had a parent if you know a parent you know one of the things that parents do is they plead with people not to make huge mistakes with their life they see things that maybe the kids don't you know I often say to my kids I've been your age and now I've been my age you guys have only been your age there are some things that I know that you guys don't know and so Paul here is looking and pleading with them and that's why I say he's in the place of God there's a place where he says I'm a worker together with God pleading on your behalf something here which was to take Jesus' yoke and not those other yokes. That Jesus broke the yoke of slavery to sin. And he says, you don't have to be under that anymore. He says, look, I've been open and honest. Remember, this whole book is all about that. Paul just lays his heart out so many times. He says, I've been transparent. I've been vulnerable. I told you the truth in love. I laid it out as clearly as I could possibly do it. And you've seen I've suffered for it. I was willing to get beaten on your behalf. He says, I would have done anything. I would have laid down my life because I know that your yoke is no joke. And I know that if you choose wisely in this area, your life will be great. And I know if you choose poorly in this area, your life will be terrible. And so Paul was here in God's place, speaking on God's behalf, pleading on God's behalf. And this is it, the place of a parent. You know, again, I say that the yoke, you can know when you have it on your life, when there's a burden for the lost, able to say, you know what, my, uh, his yoke, yeah, it is easy. I, in my life, I've experienced his grace. I can live at his pace, even if it means sometimes a, a rather difficult pace. But he says, you know what, the reason is because I can stand in his place and say, Lord, I understand your heart. I hear your heart and I see the needs that are out there and I know what people need. They need the yoke of Jesus in their life. And so this is what he says, verse 14, he says, Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, which is a word for Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Now, again, right here it says, Do not be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Why? Because your yoke is no joke. That's what he's saying. He's saying this is such a serious and important thing. And this is a verse you often hear as a reason not to marry a heathen. And maybe some of you are hoping that I'll say, no, it doesn't mean that. No, it means that. (laughs) It is true. You should not marry a heathen. And I, as a parent, plead with my kids all the time. My daughters know they're already tired of hearing it, but they're going to get to hear it at least as long as they're under my roof, which is, please, do me two favors. I don't care what job you get. I don't care how smart you are, anything else. Just love the Lord. And marry someone who loves the Lord even more than you do. Okay, those are the two requirements I'm asking. Please, please, please. And the guy, I know, Dad, you've already mentioned. Okay, please, love the Lord. Love someone who loves the Lord even more than you do if you can find them. 
And I know those two decisions will make or break their life right there. I know they will. Those two, if they get those two right, so many other things will fall into place. If they get those two wrong, nah, no matter how hard they try, it's going to be very difficult. See, and the thing is, if they don't love the Lord, you know what's going to happen? They're going to go to hell. But if they marry someone who doesn't love the Lord, you know what they're going to do? They're going to go through hell. That's one of the things that I, I do marital counsel all the time here. I know these things. And so like a parent pleading, he says, you know what, your yoke, it's no joke. Be careful. Be careful the life you live and be careful who you tie yourself to. But here's the thing. This verse certainly does uh, apply at least to marriage, but so much more. It has a wider implication that we'll talk about tonight. See, for every New Testament truth, there's an Old Testament picture. And I like this one in Deuteronomy 22.10. Deuteronomy 22.10, if you jot it down, this is just simply what it says. It's a little short proverb. It says, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Now, some of us are saying, man, I'm obedient to that verse. I am doing that verse, Lord. I've found one that I can circle, and I am in victory when it comes to that verse. I haven't plowed with an ox or a donkey, and I certainly wouldn't plow with them together. But see, what it's talking there about, there's something spiritual being said there, which is two animals with a very different nature can't share a yoke. It won't work. And so marriage is the obvious application of that. And so many people say, man, I know so much better than God. See, we're, be we're different. We're different. We're in love. And so, you know, this guy, well, you, you think at first he's something wonderful, but pretty soon you find out, man, he's a donkey, you know? <laughs> And I'll leave it at that. I won't use some of the other words, but King James Version. <laughs> some of you are saying, Scott, I, I'm hearing this too late. I already disobeyed this. Or I thought he was, and I found out he wasn't, and all these types of things. What should I do? Well, the next chapter, Pastor Pedro will discuss that very directly. But this point tonight, what is it? Which is when you face a choice, when you are on this side of a decision, what do you do? Well, once you're yoked to the Lord, you still need to make good and wise decisions on your other choices of who to be yoked to. Who will I link my life with? It'll make all the difference in my life. And he says there, don't be yoked to unbelievers. The believer and the unbeliever, why? They're at odds over almost everything. If they're not, well, something's wrong there, right? And, and, and you start thinking, well, man, we have so much in common. You say, why? How could you if you don't have Christ in common? See, and what you might have noticed is that everything Jesus said, did, and was, was really in absolute opposition to the world. That's how he ended up getting crucified. And so, you think about it, the word and the world will never agree. They're never going to walk the same way. They're never going to say, well, hey, there's an area of agreement. And so, if you yoke yourself to the word of God, well, there's no way you can simultaneously yoke yourself to the world unless you want to get pulled asunder because the world is going a very different way now what does that mean does it mean oh well you can only work for christian companies you know you can only wave to your neighbors if they are believers you know and if they're willing to come to church with you you know that's what it means uh you know that we're going to go buy a big commune you know that's the building we're building out here we're going to just all hide in that building the holy huddle and we'll never go outside and we'll stockpile rice and weapons and all that stuff. no that is not what that means. Now see, this is an important couple of words to think about. The difference between contact and a contract. Contact and a contract. And you see it this way. It, I, I just have a personal policy based on these things. I don't get into long-term, close relationships of dependence with non-believers. Business or personal, why not? Well, because we're going to be going in different directions soon enough. And if I'm yoked to Jesus, I'm going to be going his direction. And if that person's yoked to somebody else, they're going to be wanting to go that direction. And sooner or later, something is going to have to give. Now, again, a lot of times people think, I know what will give. They're going to give their life to Christ. Well, statistically, uh, not necessarily. Historically, you look at this, I've seen a lot more people lose with this one than have won. And so verse 16, it says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, thinking about this, God's really not talking about the outward rejection, of course, of things. He's talking about that inside thing. That's where he says, the temple of God. There's a separation from the things of the world inside 
first. And he's saying, you know, the, the heart, your heart is the home of Christ. And he says, you know, that's the temple of God now. God used to dwell in the Old Testament in a temple, in a tabernacle. And he says, guess what? Now the dwelling place of God is not in a building. It's in a person. And there's kind of a funny Old Testament picture that I hope will stick with you, which shows that God doesn't like time sharing. You know, some of you maybe have a time share and you think, well, you know, God's into that, right? I mean, he can have me on the weekends and, uh, you know, the world has me kind of during the week. But you think about this, 1 Samuel 5.2. I'll just read it for you and kind of summarize it. It's a long story. But 1 Samuel chapter 5, if you go look at it later, it's a very funny story. You see the, the Philistines, they were the enemies of God and they took the ark of God. They're like, cool, we got the presence of God now. And this is what they did. They brought it to their false temple and their, their God's name was Dagon. Now Dagon, I'm glad that I don't worship a God named Dagon, but that's what they did, Dagon. And so when the people of Ashdad, that's where they were from, it says, they arose early in the morning and there was Dagon fallen on his face. Uh, you know, he was there face down before the ark. So they took Dagon. And they said, oh, my goodness, our God has fallen. Uh, you know, we, we better get him back up, you know. And so they prop him back up. They say, hmm, strange. What a coincidence. And then it says the next morning they go back in there and they arose early. You know, you know why they arose early? It's because they were curious to see what had happened. And it says there was Dagon fallen on its face before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon... And both palms of its hand were broken off on the threshold, and all they had was the torso there left of it. Now, at that point, you would hope someone would wake up and realize, man, there's a difference between the false god and the real god of Israel. And one of the things that he's showing there is, again, there's really not place in any temple, in any place, for a compromise. God doesn't say, well, yeah, Dagon, he can come on in. No problem, we'll share the place. And see, here's the thing. When you're yoked together with Jesus, what it means is you take him with you wherever you go. Now, that's a good thing, but you might at a few times go, hmm, I don't know if this is a really a place that God would want to go, you know? And you think about it, he says, you're the temple of God, your mind, your heart. And what's it saying? Don't share space with God and with the wicked things of the world. And if you don't allow Jesus to take away your old life, you know what will happen? You won't ever have rest. See, it doesn't mean that a person can't have struggles and difficulties and challenges. Of course they will. Everybody's always going to have the temptations and the difficulties uh, that come with the Christian life. That's never going to go away. But one of the most miserable places to live is when you say, you know what, I'm going to try to timeshare my heart and my life. I'm going to try to have more than one yoke. Because the, li the life that we live, we really don't have time for more than one yoke. And the most miserable people I've ever met are those who have too much of Jesus to really enjoy their sin anymore and too much sin to really enjoy Jesus. That's a terrible place to live. You'll never find rest in that spot. So that's why he says, hey, take my yoke upon you. Let me be your master. You know, let me kick out the other gods in your life and put them face down in your life. And you're going to find yourself at a much greater place of rest. Now, it says in the last part of 2 Corinthians 6 here, it says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what's unclean. I'll receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Almighty. Now, again, thinking of that word, he's saying, come to me. Right here, he's saying, come out. Be separate. And guess what? He says, I will receive you. Now, I know this much. If you yoke up with Jesus, some people will not receive you. They will reject you. That is just a part of the Christian experience. Probably you've experienced it if you've come to Christ. You come to Christ, you're going to get some rejection. Why? The same rejection that he received, you will receive as well. And so you may lose some so-called friends along the way as you come to Christ. But this is what I know to be absolutely true. You will find the best friend you will ever have and have ever had and he says there I will receive you and God has a very big family and he will replace the people who reject you certainly with those who will accept you for the right reasons because so many people accept you in the world only for the wrong reasons and so God here he's saying you know what you can have contact but you can't have contract you can't have a closeness to those of the world who are really heading the other way because sooner or later if you stay behind with them 
you're not going to be going forward with Christ. Now, again, God isn't saying that you can't have contact you know, with your unbelieving family. You know, don't go home and say, Pastor Scott said I was supposed to you know, never call you again, Mom, or any of that sort of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying you know, at work tomorrow you, know, you wear rubber gloves and don't get near anybody. It's just saying a, a good, honest look to say, you know what, really, the group of close contacts that I have, the real people who I consider my group, Am I influencing them for Christ or are they influencing me for the world? You know, you think about it, if you go to a doctor, they will touch you to help, certainly. They will touch you to heal, but they're not casual about the risks associated with this. You may have read it just today. It was a breaking news story today that there was a nurse in, in London who died of AIDS seven years after a needle prick there that was infected with the, with the AIDS virus. And so... You know, the, the danger, certainly people will understand who work around these things understand, hey, yes, I may be there to help. I may be there to assist, but I am not there casually just saying, oh, there's no risk associated with this. Listen, there's great risk associated with sin. And God says, you know what, you got to be able to come out of those things and know that I will receive you. See, when we're yoked together with Jesus, we live in his place. And that place was a parental pleading. I already said that. And it's telling, God's telling us as his kids, look, don't touch that, it's going to hurt you. That's all he's saying. He's not saying, hey, don't touch that, it's going to be fun. He's saying, no, don't touch that, it is going to kill you. And I kind of want to close out with a, a story that is, is from my own life, and it, it's, a, it's a funny story, I think. Hopefully you will too. My mom was traveling with two young kids, and that by itself is, is tribulation. You know, that is... Uh, everything that Paul went through can't compare to traveling with my sister and I, I'm sure. You know, my mom could certainly trade stories with him. But my sister used to get car sick whenever she was in the car, and she, whenever, especially whenever we'd either go under a bridge or through a tunnel, she would throw up. Now, you know, don't get all Freudian on things and start analyzing that, but that's what my sister would do. She would go, th we'd go through a tunnel and, bleh, you know, all over the car. So my mom would try and take the route other ways and all this sort of thing, but my sister was getting sick and, and my mom pulled into a rest stop, you know, and she tried to, to go in there and, and there was just a little booth. And so my mom told me very messy floor, messy everything, you know, and how moms are with germs and everything. So she tells me, little kid here, you know, Scott, don't touch anything. Do not touch anything. And it's very cold out and everything. So I'm in a big old jacket. So she goes in with my sister. My sister's in the little stall, blah, 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 all the rest of the stuff. And all of a sudden, over, this, over the sound of that comes the sound of me screaming at the top of my lungs. Now, my mom rushes out of the stall to find me flopping like a fish face down on the filthy floor. You know, just every parent's worst nightmare, you know. And there I am just blah, 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 having some kind of seizure or something. So my mom picks me up only to find that my hands were in my pockets like this because she had told me not to touch anything and I had fallen forward. <laughs> so that, that's the origination if you've ever heard the I've fallen and I can't get up. I think, I think they should give my mom royalties for that one. That's where that came from. Now you think about that again. What has God done in our life? Well, we've fallen and we can't give it and get up. That's the... That's the human condition, right? And God has said certain things, hey, don't touch it. And maybe some of you have even lived your life trying to do that, you know, in your own strength. Okay, God, I'm going to be a good little kid and I'm not going to touch anything bad. And then you find yourself flopping around on the filth and you say, how did I get here? How did this ever happen? This isn't the way I thought it would be. This isn't what I thought would happen. And so you think about it, a, a good parent, what would they do? Kick a kid when they're down? No, they pick them up. They, t they clean them off and they say, hey, you keep close to me from now on. You know, you keep right here so this won't happen again. And so the light and easy yoke of Jesus, it's really contrasted in the Bible with that heavy yoke of sin, that condemnation, that burdensome thing of being crushed by guilt, of being chained by anger and addiction and all the things that come into a person's life when they're apart from God. Deep in depression or just stuck in some cycle of sin. And you know, some people will listen to that and say, that's, that's really not my life. I, I really have stayed relatively clean. I've made decent choices, but somehow things are still empty for me. Well, I wonder, 
If like in my life, well, I made some decent choices, but I missed one very important one, which is I never really took the yoke of Christ upon me. I never really came to him like he said to. I, I'd come to church. I'd you know, come to some classes along the way, or thing, but I'd never really come to Christ. And there's such a difference between those things. And you can find religion to be something very, very heavy over time. But a relationship with Christ is such a different thing. And so this chapter here, if you think back to verse 2, this is what it said. God was just saying, hey, in the acceptable time, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I like that. It says God heard us and he helped us. And I don't know what God hears coming out of your heart, but I know what he heard coming out of mine all those years ago, which was help, <laughs> help. You know, maybe nobody else heard it, but I heard it. I knew it was there. And God heard it loud and clear. I was basically just telling him, like so many do, God, help, I can't take this life alone any longer. You know, I, I just can't bear the burdens of life and the meaninglessness of it apart from you. I would look at things and read things and try to find self-help and everything else, and it was like, I just, I just can't take it anymore. The other day, it was kind of like that at our house. I was lifting something, and I thought it, I could do it, and, and, and all of a sudden, Lynn heard, help, you know, and so she, she did what any good wife would do. She came and ran and opened the door for me, saved me from that, you know. What if she had said, later, <laughs> I'm walking the dog, you know. <laughs> what if I'd been too proud to, oh, I can, I, I got, she would have found me underneath all of that rubble. But you know, that's the thing. God will even look under that. Even if you're crushed under all of that and you say, help God, I need you. He says, I've heard you. I'll help you. And the thing is, he talks about today. And so Paul there in verse one, he was pleading with God. Just same thing I'm doing here. Which is, he says, please don't receive the grace of God in vain. Now people have stumbled on that verse, tried to figure out what that means. As best I understand it, this is what it means. How is it possible to receive God's grace in vain? Well, the word vain means so that it has no effect, of no value, of no benefit to somebody. And think of this physical example as we close out. Maybe it's a description of your life. Very popular to give gift cards right now. I mean, I, I don't know. I love to get them. I love to give them. They're really a cool uh, invention. But last year, I don't know if you knew this, $25 billion dollars in the United States were spent on gift cards, just gift cards alone. And catch this, 10% on average never get used. Now right now some of you are thinking in your wallet, now where did I put that gift card? But that's $2.5 billion dollars of gracious gifts given in vain. And it breaks my heart just to think of it. It breaks my heart to think of all that Cheesecake Factory stuff just sitting there unclaimed, you know, where I think, <laughs> That could be mine, you know, or chilies, or on the border, I'm just giving out some suggestions here, macaroni <laughs> grill, you know, any of those kind of places, but stuck in a drawer somewhere, you know, somebody gave it, somebody paid for it, somebody did everything necessary, except it's still the person's responsibility to cash it, to cash it in, to take it in and enjoy the blessing of the food. And so, so many people, they throw it away with the wrapping paper, I don't even know where it went, you know, or just carry it around the wallet, stick it in a drawer, Forget all about it, and it's never used for food. And that's receiving a gift in vain. It's been paid for, it's available, but you're not going to get the benefit from it. And so Paul went on to say, you know what, don't do that. Don't do that. God has already given the gift of grace. He paid for it. It was very expensive, more than $2 billion, more than $25 billion. It was something so expensive we could have never afforded to pay for it. But he says, I'm going to give it to you for free but you have to receive it. And so that's why he says, today is the day of salvation. Now's the time. You don't want to be like Felix. Don't make the mistake of Felix. Some of you are thinking, Felix the cat? The wonderful, wonderful cat? <laughs> no, a different cat. Probably none of you were thinking of that until I said it. But this was a guy out of Acts 24. And it was a guy from Paul's experience. And meeting guys like this are some of the ones who will change a guy like Paul and change a person like me. You think about this, he met Felix, Roman ruler, and this is what it says. Paul reasoned about righteousness. He talked to Felix about this stuff. It says he talked to him about self-control and the judgment to come and the need for God's grace. And it says Felix was afraid and answered him and said, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call you. Well, guess what? A convenient time never 
came for Felix, and Felix never called. And so I'd say, don't be like Felix. Don't make that same mistake. When God calls out with his grace, don't let it be in vain. There's no such thing as a better time. And today is the day. Today is the day for someone or someone's here. Jesus is calling you now, and he's just calling you with that simple thing that he does. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And I just say to you before we pray, I'm going to give an opportunity just for someone to raise their hand if that's your heart that you say, I need to come to him. I want that yoke upon me. Remember, with his yoke, you'll always have rest, no matter what else you go through. But without his yoke, you will always be restless, no matter whatever else is right in your life. So let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And Father, I pray that you would call to the heart of anybody who is here who does not yet know you, who does not yet have that confidence and that clarity to the fact that they have come to you and they've taken your yoke upon them and that they have a ease to their life, a, a lightness to their life because there's light in it. And no matter what else happens, they know that you will never leave or forsake them. And so, Lord, I pray as we just give that opportunity that we always do here, that if there's anyone's heart who just is saying, help, Lord, that you would hear and that you would help as you already have. And so if there's anyone here with that need, I'm just going to ask you while our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, if you'll just raise your hand right there in your seat to acknowledge your need. Say, I need the Lord. You're, by raising your hand, you're saying yes to salvation. You're saying yes to forgiveness. You're saying yes to life in Christ. Anybody here tonight who wants to do that, the scripture says now is the time. There is no guarantee of tomorrow. It never says wait. Try me next week. No, he says, now is the acceptable time. God would hear you tonight. Anybody here in the room, just slip your hand up so I can see it. I see the two of you here. God bless you. Anybody else here in the room wants to pray that prayer and ask for God to come into their life? Anybody else? For those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's a prayer of commitment to Christ, and it's just asking him to do what he's already promised to do for those who receive him. Pray these words. God, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my friend. I cast my sin upon you, Jesus, because you promised to take that burden that was too much for me to bear. I pray that you would give me life and that you would give me that life abundantly. And I thank you. I want to follow you every day forward from this day. And I pray that you would, by your spirit, make that possible. In Jesus' name, amen.